I'm just trying to make sure I have everything recording the way it's supposed to. For those that can't make it this morning, I want to make sure that it's available to them later on. So to begin, um, I will be teaching on momentum. Uh, I want to just share a prayer with you. It was, it was Paul's prayer uh, to the Church of Ephesus. And I'm going to read it from the, the message. That's why when I heard of the solid trust you have in Master Jesus and your outpouring of love to all Christians, I couldn't stop thanking God for you every time I prayed. I think of you and I give thanks, but I do more than thank. I ask. I ask God of our Master Jesus Christ, the God of glory, to make you intelligent and discerning and knowing him personally, your eyes focused and clear so that you may see exactly what he is calling you to do. Grasp the immensity of his, this glorious way of life he has for Christians. Oh, the utter extravagance of his work in us who trust him, endless energy and boundless strength. All this energy issues from Christ. God raised him from death and set him on a throne in deep heaven in charge of running the universe. Everything from galaxies to governments, no name and no power exempt from this rule. And not just for this time being, but forever. He is in charge of all. Uh, in charge of all. Those who have known me for a while know that I often say God is in charge. He's not necessarily in control. I think that we need to be very careful how we define that. This morning, uh, I'm going to talk on uh, momentum. A uh, couple of things uh, before I start. One of them is uh, I really appreciate those of you who have been consistent in your giving. It makes it a lot easier for us who are on the other end uh, to take care of things that are related to uh, the homeless, the recovering, the poor, uh, the benevolence that, that comes in changes things dynamically. Uh, just this morning, I read a story, and it was not here. It was in Alabama, but this woman had gone into a store, and she had stolen five eggs. And no, it's not a joke. And the police showed up. They were called, and they showed up, and they asked her what she stole, and she told them that she stole five eggs. They ushered her out, and a little while later, one of the police officers showed up at her home and he brought groceries with him. I think that we need to understand that God is moving on people's hearts to change things. I just read um, just the other day that benevolence has increased during COVID-19, that in the midst of a trial, people are giving more. You know, giving is one of the ways that we honor God. It's one of the ways we worship. And so I really appreciate it when you do give. Uh, the church fellowship appreciates it when you give. The, the people that are blessed appreciate it when you give. Uh, your giving is, is really important. Just because we don't meet in a building, we're, we're, we're church at home. Uh, some people have decided to invite others to come to their home and uh, sit, and watch, so maybe you're one of those people that has a cup of coffee going, and you're just waiting to see where God's taking us. Uh, our momentum was broken by COVID-19 in some respects for us individually as a church fellowship. Uh, the place we met was canceled. Uh, they couldn't take care of it. Um, I check in every month to see where we're at, but the church was never a building. It, it never was a building. It was always the people, and those people gather. Uh, so giving, thank you. If you're, if you're just watching us for the first time or you're, you've been watching us and you're interested in giving, you can give through Square. You can give through PayPal. You can mail uh, checks. Uh, I appreciate if you wouldn't mail cash. Um, and other, others know that who live near me that they can always stop by and uh, bring their offerings and giving. And uh, those go into the account, and they're taken care of. Uh, the other part is, at the end of uh, the message, I'm going to uh, share communion. You know, it doesn't matter if you have a dried-up saltine or uh, a Ritz cracker that's been around a while or a loaf of bread, a cup of wine, a cup of juice. 
Uh, the important thing is that we believe in the miraculous, that we believe that we are the body of Christ and the miraculous working of the Father is ever for operating. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, kick into the message. I, uh, many, many years ago, I, I began to follow John Maxwell. I would say it was probably in, uh, I'm going to say, 93, 94. I began to hear John Maxwell's name come up. And he had a book that was called 21, 21 Laws of Leadership. And if you're interested in becoming a better leader, if you're interested in becoming a better individual, if you're interested, you know, whether it's church-related, business-related, work-related, family-related, if you want to learn, John Maxwell is certainly a go-to. Uh, great guy, and uh, he's funny, and he's succinct, and he gets right to the point. Well, years ago, he wrote this, this uh, book, and in it, he wrote about the law of Big Mo, meaning momentum. And he talked about seven facts about momentum. And I'm going to share these with you because I think it, it describes where we go. The first one is momentum is a great exaggerator. Momentum makes things better. When things aren't going well, momentum uh, makes things seem worse. So the first one is momentum is the great exaggerator. The second one, he said, momentum makes leaders look better than they are. When you're winning, people want to party up with you, when they forget about all the things you did wrong, and, and they look to that. Now you're saying, well, Lee, I'm not a leader. No, but you may be a family member, uh, just saying. Uh, momentum helps people do better. They perform better than they are. When, when they have motivation and they have that momentum and they're excited and they want to do things, they want to get behind that. So the law of big mo or momentum it, what it does is it boosts everyone's success. It's more natural to steer. It is easier, you know, there's, there, for years before I, I heard of John Maxwell, I heard it is easier to steer a ship that is on its way than one that is standing still in the water. I grew up on the ocean, and uh, I have had a lot of friends who sailed, and when I went to camp, I sailed, and uh, there's this thing called uh, falling into irons. Basically, a sailboat goes one way, and then it, when it gets to the end of that, it tacks across, so it's gathering the wind on the other way, and it keeps doing it. Tacks, goes back and forth, back and forth. The idea being to keep your sails full, but there's this process, not even a process, there's this thing that happens if you miss the tack, all of a sudden you'll hear your, your, your sails will start fluttering, and they're not doing anything, and it's called being in irons. And trying to steer, trying to get your boat turned into the wind again is a tremendous output. It, it takes a lot of energy. And, and, and so uh, momentum causes us to be better and it makes it easier to steer with. It's the most potent change agent. When things are going well, things are going well. And with enough momentum, anything is possible. I don't know about you, but um, when I was a kid, you know, invariably, I lived in, in, in a rural area, uh, you know, even though, as I said, I, I, I was close to the ocean and everything. I lived in a rural area, and it was not unusual to have somebody get stuck, you know, ice, snow, a tractor, car, somebody ran out of gas, and everybody gather around to push, and it took a lot of energy to move something, you know, some people call it priming the pump. But when we're talking about vehicles and things, invariably what would happen is everybody would be fighting really, really hard and they'd get this vehicle or whatever, you know, whatever it is, and they'd get it moving and it'd make it. Or somebody would stop and then maybe somebody else would stop and all of a sudden you're there and, you know, you're pushing this car up this, up this hill and all of a sudden everybody stops and you feel it starting to move backwards towards you. And it develops another momentum. It develops the momentum that can crush you. So momentum is, is you know, in a church fellowship, it probably falls on me, but John Maxwell has another law. When things are going well, thank the leaders. And when things aren't going well, thank the leaders. Uh, you know, momentum begins inside. It's, it's uh, a way of, of dealing with things. And 
momentum is, is, it takes a lot of energy sometimes to get things going. I, uh, I received some news earlier this week. It made me realize that I had to get back to some of the practices of exercise that I neglected. So this morning comes around, so you know, I'm out there walking two plus miles a day. And this morning comes up and I'm laying in bed, it's 5.30 in the morning. And the last thing I wanna do is get up and go for a walk. The last thing I wanna do is extend myself. But I knew that if I didn't do it, it would be harder tomorrow. So I was out there at six o'clock and you can all say yay. Um, it was still tough. Uh, I was glad to get it over. Adrenaline, um, adrenaline, oh well, adrenaline sometimes is a result of momentum. You know, I, I, uh, I see a lot of things happen in life and I, uh, I see people get all charged up about things and stuff that, you know, when they're excited, they wanna do things. And I'm gonna talk about that. But I wanna talk about some things that I call negative momentum. And the reason is because I think these are traps. And I think it's important sometimes that we know what the traps are so we don't get caught in them. So these are the things that kill motivation. These are the things that kill uh, momentum. The first one is routine. Now, there are routines that are good. You know, everybody likes to know that, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They like to know that when a certain time comes around, they can go to bed and they can wake up at a certain time. And if there's work, they, they you know, there's, there's something to be said about routine. But what I've noticed happening is people, uh, you know, we were in the routine of gathering, you know, we were in the routine of assembling, and, you know, worship and message and praying for one another. And then COVID-19 came and people, uh, we're challenged. And I want to address that for a minute before I get to the challenge. Um, I'm going to, again, I want to read something from the message this morning. And, and there, it's important to me that you, you would hear this. Uh, it's in Matthew um, 11. And Jesus has resumed talking to people, but now he's tenderly speaking. He says, the Father has given me all these things to do and say, this is the unique father-son operation coming out of the father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the son the way the father does and nor the father the way the son does, but I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone who is willing to listen. And so that was my first prayer. It didn't use the words revelation and wisdom because I read it out of the message and it had a different uh, translation, if you will. But to reveal, there's a revelation. I want this morning to reveal some things to you. Not just necessarily some people go, oh, great, here he goes. He's going to tell us down. No, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Now, when, when people, you know, there's this teaching and everybody wants to hang out with their same tribe. And, you know, they want to hang out with people who think alike and la, la, la. And I think there's a value to that. I do. I, you know, it's comfortable, but there's also a recognition, you know, that whole tribe thing. I was in a, I was in a church one time and they, oh, I'm of the tribe of this. And I'm like, fine. And I just come along and I say, you know, in 70 AD, they burned down, you know, they burned down the house. No one knows what tribe they're of. I mean, there's some oral tradition and things like that. But for most of us, we don't know what tribe we came from. Many of us can't get ourselves back past 300 years ago in the Mayflower or, you know, that kind of thing. You know, we can't get past 1620. You know, my wife is doing genealogy. Uh, she's got a program. And she's working with other people and she's gathering. And she wants to know who's part of her family. Jesus comes along and he, he's, he's for everybody. Paul comes along and reminds us that we are the body of Christ. So I'm going to ask the question that Jesus asked. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. 
Let's try that again. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. One of the things that's happened in COVID-19 is a lot of people were relying on what they call church. The church is individuals. It's not a building. It's not a place. It's not a gathering on Sunday morning. We don't go to church. We are the church. We forget that what we sow into things is really important. If we only gathered because it was Sunday morning and we know we have to, then our discipline when that disappears is we don't know what to do with ourselves. Oh, I don't have to go to church anymore because we forget that I'm the church, that you're the church. And what happens is we forget about the practices, the powerful principles and the practices of the kingdom that appear in Acts 2. So here's Jesus saying, if you'll come to me, I'll recover your life. He goes on to say, I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Did Jesus stop praying? Nope. Did Jesus stop giving? Nope. Did Jesus stop gathering? Nope. Did, did he stop feeding the poor? Nope. How do we know that? Because we, we know that, um, you know, even, even at the Sermon of the Mount, thousands of people on a hillside, a little boy brings up his McDonald's bag with fish and chips, and Jesus multiplies it. And if his disciples didn't get it, go read how many baskets of food was left over and how many disciples there were. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn, this is key, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. So what I've said to people, if gathering is a burden, it's because you're legalistic. Gathering is a burden, it's because you haven't understood the unforced rhythms of grace. My friend Lynn Hiles even wrote a book about rhythms of grace. That passage comes from there. So here we are, and we have things that have crept into our lives. Our momentum has gone away. My wife and I were talking about giving, um, and I just forgot one week. And I wasn't freaking out about it, but I forgot to, I forgot to you know, make my offering. <clears throat> and what happens is people say, well, giving isn't important. Well, it is, okay? Time, talent, and treasure. All three are important. If you're, if you're giving of your time, that's important. But if you're only giving of your time, then you're wasting the gift of talent and you're wasting the gift of, of treasure that God has put in your hands. Paul says, when you come, when, you know, when you give, not if you give, when you give. And, and so you can't get around that. Oh, well, you can. I mean, I'm not, I'm, you know, this is why tribes are tough. If you get with people who say, ah, it doesn't matter, then you'll never be brought to the fullness of what God really wants you to be and who he wants you to be. It's not like your identity changes because you give or don't give. He made you who you are. It's not like your identity is going down the tubes because you serve or don't serve. But what does happen is this. When, when things are going well, and I'm talking about momentum, when things are going well, it's easy. When things aren't going well, if you were to follow the farmers in other places, if there was a tornado or there was a flood or there was you know, something that destroyed their crops, you know, what they did was they either went totally out of business or they planted all the way up to the front doorstep the next time. They sowed more because they understood the principle. And so what happens to people is when we stop serving, giving of our time, or we stop doing what God's gifted us to do, or we stop giving, what happens is when we, when we do those things, the momentum shifts. Now, I wanna be very clear, God is not your destructor. He's not your destroyer. He's not coming after you because you don't do something right, okay? But this is what I know happens. When I have food in the refrigerator and something bad happens, I'm not weird about it. When 
my car, one car is running and the other one doesn't, I'm not weird about it. But what happens is when we stop sowing, we stop reaping and we destroy the momentum that we've created. And it may not happen today, tomorrow, whatever, but this is what I know. At some point, something breaks down. At some point, something gives out. Now, in a moment, God can bring restoration to that. But a lot of that's channeled through our faith and our believing that God will do that for us. And if we already feel like something's wrong, then that, that ought to have been the red light on our dashboard saying, beep, 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 need to make a change. God's not wrecking things. The flip side of that is the miraculous. My wife and I both could tell you that one time I bought this car and it had a lot of miles on it. And here's the deal. In 160,000 miles, one set of tires. In 160,000 miles, a $100 repair. We're talking years. We're talking startup business, startup ministry. Didn't know what God was doing. Just knew time, talent, treasure. So if we've lost momentum in area, it's time to bring restoration to that area. So back to what kills things. Routine kills things a lot of time. Fear. I have never met or encountered as much fear as I have encountered in the last few months in the body of Christ. People are afraid, they stop taking risks. People are afraid, they fail to give their best effort. People are afraid, they begin to hoard their finances. People are afraid, they begin to stop serving. People are afraid, they, they, stop, they stop the things they know are the powerful practices of the kingdom. The next one is, sometimes, what throws our momentum off is having a successful time of something because success can lead to complacency. We, uh, we, we stop watching out for the things or we stop doing the things that brought us to that place of success. Oh, I've reached the pinnacle of what I'm going to do. I'm all done. And so when we deal with this feeling of feeling like we've arrived, what happens is it works against us in often cases, many cases. It works against us. So if you had something powerful happen in your life, don't stop. Don't stop. A few years ago, many of my friends know this, I went through a difficult time situationally. I stopped doing some things in the business that I had. I, I didn't give up. I just stopped doing some things and I watched that business start to tank. Well, now I'm in the process of regrowing that business and it takes a lot to prime the pump. That's all I'm gonna say about it. The next thing is, um, one of the routine killers of momentum is a lack of direction. Where are we going? People call me and they say, hey, let's go back. When are we gonna be back in the building? I don't know, but I'm not planning that we're gonna be back in the building. And if we get the building back, then I'm, I'm excited about that. But between here and there, we're gonna be just like the church that you read about in Acts 2. And so I don't wanna leave people wondering. I don't have any say in it. God has say in it and I continue to speak out on our behalf and I continue to, to pray and reach out to God and you know, have that conversation. But in the midst of that, I'm still praying for people and I'm still caring about people and I'm still doing the things I know to be truth. Um, Maybe you had a failure happen in your life. Maybe you lost momentum and something happened. Maybe it was like you forgot to sow in an area. It doesn't have to be financial. It could be family. It could be friends. It could be whatever the deal is. But you've had a crop failure. And now you're up against it in some areas. And now you don't know what to do. Um, I think there's lessons to be learned. And I think that we can change. But failure isn't the end of things. I've said it for many years, and I mean it in all sincerity. My ministry was founded on mistakes, not just my own, but the ones of some of the people around me, you know? I think one of the things, the next one, you know, one of the things that I think has happened in the middle of the crisis that we're facing is apathy. And, you know, we've lost our passion. 
We forgot about what we believe, you know? And when we start becoming apathetic, momentum starts to channel up. And, and the unfortunate part is it becomes like a magnet. Just as, just as you want to push this car to the top of the hill and get it over the thing, when you're coming down, if it has a negative, and I'm using the word a negative momentum, you know, you want it to stop, but you can't. I'm sure you've seen all the, the cartoons and things where somebody's trying to hold the car and they, you know, it's been pushed down the hill and they're trying to get in the seat and, the, you know, all those things. We cannot afford to be apathetic. The next one is a process called burnout. And, and let me just tell you, there's an unforced rhythm of grace. So if you or people you know are experiencing burnout, it's, trying to, it's because they're trying to apply legalistic principles and tendencies. They're forgetting that the very grace that helped them is still available. But oftentimes what happens is when things aren't going well, people turn to legalistic response. They do it by the numbers rather than just going, Father, here's the deal. You know, um, I used to run from God when I made a mistake. Now I'm just like, you know what, God, I totally screwed up. I'm not even asking you to fix it. I'm just asking you to be there and just pat me on the head and tell me you love me. Tell me you love me. Um, and, and, and the next thing is sometimes we're the one, we feel like we're the one rowing the boat. No one else is doing anything. And these feelings of being undervalued or being mistreated or being mis you know, used improperly start to creep up. And we need to get by those things. You know, we, we, need to, uh, we need to walk in the things we know to be truth. And we need to come around to the things that are positive, and we need to move on the things that are uh, working against us. You know, uh, this week, my wife and I went through a number of things that went against us. 90% of them had nothing to do with us. They just went against us. And, you know, we're faced with choices just like anybody else when something goes wrong. You know, many years ago, um, I walked into a workplace. I was uh, the number one store manager in a company and they treated me like garbage. And I worked hard. And we came to this place where the supervisor came in and he picked up my phone, it was a desk phone, not a, not a cell phone, but he picked up my desk phone and he threw it through the wall because he was angry. And he wasn't even angry at me, he was angry at somebody he had just spoken to on the phone. You know, because what he would do, oftentimes he would come into a one of the stores and he would make calls to the other stores and la la la. And he was, and, 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 and I just realized that this is not the place for me. For nine months, I had been the number one store manager for nine months. I had accomplished things that no other store of 250 stores had accomplished. And I came home on Friday, had to tell my wife I had lost my job. And uh, that weekend I started my internet company and I started our church fellowship because I knew, I know me, that if I allow things to take advantage of me, to weigh on me, um, I'm gonna lose my momentum. I'm gonna lose my desire for things. You know, when things aren't going right, the first thing people wanna put away is, is this. They wanna stop reading this. They wanna stop praying. You know, what difference does it matter if I give? What difference does it make if I serve or don't serve? How am I gonna serve? We don't have a place to serve in. Um, I've said for a very long time that the church needs to become agile. It needs to become strategic and agile. It needs to develop the ability to do things. And so as I look at momentum in my own life, you know, there's things that I do out of discipline. You know, I eat better than I used to. I exercise, 
I hang out with people even when I don't feel like hanging out with people because I know that there's going to be something in the middle of that that I can hang my hat on. That even in the midst of craziness, God is still availing himself to me. You know, one of the scriptures that I always have held on to is the one where uh, Shimmy's up on a cliff and yelling at David. He's cursing him. And David's armor bearer is there. He goes, you know, I can pop him. I can kill him. And David goes, no, even in his cursing, you may have a message for me. I'm not saying you should subject yourself to abuse. But I think it's really important to recognize that in the midst of all things, there are people that we're going to encounter that we may not have the best relationship with. I've determined in my life that I'm going to be an exhorter. I'm not just going to be an encourager. Hey, Johnny, you're doing great. Johnny, you are the best at what you do. But sometimes I'm going to say, hey, Johnny, you're walking off the pathway. That's not where you want to go. An exhortation is saying to Johnny, Johnny, you are better than this. And that's what I say oftentimes to people going through difficult times. I'm not minimizing the difficult time. I understand fully and I embrace it, mourn with those who mourn. I just watched a friend of mine, uh, Lynn, he just lost his mom uh, a few weeks ago. Um, man I had interviewed and I watched, he did something really, really dumb, really stupid. And he's probably going to go to jail for it. And even in my interview, I felt like I had something for him. And even though I didn't like or want what was going on, I embraced who he was. Because it's not my job. It's God's job. And, and he wasn't a believer. But the principles of the kingdom avail themselves for all. You know, uh, the richest men in the world know that giving is important. And they knew that before they began to give or before they became rich. Um, they know that serving is important. Well, they just do it for PR. Okay, maybe they do. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what, what the reason is. The reign of God falls on the just and the unjust. So how do we change things? How do we change things up? I don't want to live my life like a roller coaster or an amusement park ride. Um, I understand seasons and I understand the rhythms of grace. Certainly a lot better today than I did 20 years ago. Um, momentum speeds up pro progress. You know, for years we've heard the church talk about, we need to be ready for acceleration. Acceleration is coming. Acceleration part and parcel. I mean, if we're talking about acceleration and a miracle happens, and we call that that Kairos moment, where God seems to come out of the air and do something miraculous, I absolutely embrace that. I absolutely embrace that. Um, but sometimes to get something to accelerate, you need to create a momentum. You need to prime the pump. You need something big in your life. When I need something big in my life and it's financial, I sow bigger. My wife and I just got, you know, we had something just happen against us. And my response is going to be, I'm going to take the next six months and I'm going to sow bigger than I ever gave before because we need that. Momentum speeds up progress and it propels you forward. The Amplified Bible describes the word blessed, and they say blessed, happy, fortunate, and to be envied. Now, I'm not saying envy is a good thing, but people ought to look at you and say, oh, why, why is Lee doing better? Why is Joe doing better? And, and I don't think envy means the green-eyed demon shows up. I think that people need to look in to our lives, and they need to know that we're real, that we occasionally have bad days, but they also need to know that there's principles that we practice in our lives that are important. And so I want to be blessed, happy, fortunate, and much to be envied because that's what the meaning of blessed is. 
just saying bless you, when, when I say bless somebody, what I'm saying is I desire that you be blessed in every area of your life. I'm not jealous. Have at it. Be, be happy. Be, be fortunate. And let people wonder what your secret is. No, tell them. Momentum, when we're talking about spiritual things, is the more we become consumed with the Lord and his church. Because we can't, we can't, you know, I see those bumper stickers. I love the Lord, but I'm not so sure about his followers. Well, that's just goofy. That's goofy. You know, and you end up, you know, I mean, the joke used to be, you know, you show up at church and you, you look for a church that was everything you wanted. And then when you got there, it wasn't because you were there. Uh, I don't agree with that, by the way. I just think it's a goofy joke. Um Frustrations, a lot of us have frustrations. We don't get to see family, we don't get to see friends. My wife was frustrated because she didn't get to bury her father properly. And I, and I, and I, I think it's really important that we get to do those things. I really do. My heart broke and does for my wife and her family. But I also know that I don't wanna lose momentum in my relationship with my wife, and moving things ahead. So number one, because everybody likes a list. Momentum is propelled by a healthy soul. Every church gathering has a soul. And whether it's just like, just like it, it's our core. It's like being, you know, you're, everybody hears about core training and exercise. You gotta have something set, stable and central. And, uh, you know, if people are indifferent or they're ambivalent or they're, they're always politicking and they're always very negative, uh, those are the things that eat, eat away at the fabric of the church. Not the, not the church, the building, or even the, the place with a name on it, but the people. And believe me, I want to say this. I don't avoid negative people, okay? If you avoid negative people, I get it. But Jesus didn't avoid negative people. I don't think he spent 99.9% .9 of his time with them. And I think we need to be careful about how we hang out with people. But you are you may well be the only light they ever see. So if you don't show up, who's going to show up? So John said, Beloved, I desire that you would prosper and be in good health in the same way as your soul prospers. You and I need to work on our mental health, our spiritual health, our resting health. We need to work on that. Beloved, I desire that you would prosper. Prosper, you know, this is my wallet. Prosper, there is a reality to prosperity. And when you give, you give. And you trust God with it. Prosper and be in good health. And, you know, one of the things I, I, I say this a lot and I say this because if you if you study the medical world, people that are always angry or negative or disappointed or crotchety, they have lots of physical ailments. And one of those ailments is it affects their adrenals, which means their body's always in fight or flight mode. And when their body's always in fight or flight mode, your body can't process food properly. It, 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 it becomes destructive. It becomes a cancer unto itself, if you will. I'm not talking about physical cancer. I'm talking about it, though I, I guess it can manifest that way. So we need to take care. We need to take care. Uh, you know, we need to feed this, this uh, mind of Christ. We need to feed it. Well, Lee, it didn't work for me. Okay. How's your, you know, I, 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 there's things that I prayed for and they didn't work. You know, it, it, it's interesting. Jesus says, pray, you know, whatsoever you pray. Believe it, you can have it. Okay, that's part one. And then Paul comes along, and he, you know, I mean, or James comes along, and he says, "Don't pray amiss." And then Paul comes along, and he says, "Make sure that your mind is aligned with what God is in your prayers." So praying for you know 100 pounds of junk food probably isn't going to work. Just saying. So we need, you know, we need to have a healthy soul. The next part is we need to have a momentum that's contagious. You know, I've been in meetings where 
healing started to break out. And the more it started to break out, we used to call it popcorn. And healing would break out and somebody jumped up and they were excited and it began to bounce around the room. I've been in other meetings where, uh, you know, somebody put in an offering and all of a sudden everybody got the vision for it. And they just began to give and give and give. And, and people say, well, they're foolish for doing it that way. No, I don't think so. I mean, you know, Paul talks about, the, you know, you read, it's the foolish things that confound the wise. So, so it's contagious. And, and I think there's a momentum, you know, if the church would learn to do the things that are important rather than the things that are unimportant, I think we would develop a contagion. You know, the difficulty is, and I'm, I'm going to use this, and I probably shouldn't use it, but I'm going to say it anyhow. I said many, many years ago that the, the church has been inoculated with just enough Jesus to make it immune to what he's doing. And no one likes inoculations and vaccines, and I get all that. But what I was saying was we, we learned just enough about Jesus to make us like things, but we became immune to a lot of his ways. You know, one of the things the church forgot out, you know, that when we partake in Jesus, we some days partake in the sufferings of Christ. I'm not telling you you're necessarily going to be hanging on a cross, but I think we can't get past that. So we need to find a momentum of positivity, of spiritual outpouring, and it will become contagious. It will affect your family, you know? Um, just as I told you, um, momentum has a season. Just as I talked about the unforced rhythms of God, when God is, you know, Christ is calling us to them. Every calendar has, has seasons. And, you know, we're, we're coming up to the end of summer and we're going to begin, you know, fall. And there's an ebb and a flow. And I, I think there's a reality in that that's really important. That, you know, there's times when things aren't going well, that you just can't force the issue. There's times when things are going good that you don't want to take your foot off the gas pedal. Um, I don't want to waste my time in seasons that aren't. This morning, I gave a word, and I feel like I say the time is now. Now, anybody who knows me knows that's not something I say on a regular basis. It's not like, oh, the time is now. This is what we're going to do. No, because um, I don't believe that. But there's, the time is now to make some changes. The changes we make today on this ebbing, on this place of momentum are going to change things dynamically for the next five to 10 years. Five to 10 years. Oh, Lee, I don't know if I believe that. Okay, okay, that's fine. I, I, I don't get weird. If you, if you judge it to be a false word or you don't agree with me, that's fine. But I do believe the time is now. I think it's time for the church to stand up with its talent and its treasure and its time. And I think we need to prime the pump. The Bible says that out of our bellies will flow living waters. Rivers of living waters. I walked by a river this morning. It was just moseying on down. If you didn't look closely, you didn't really see the mov movement of it. Other times it's rained and that river has been a raging, you know, it just <clears throat> times and seasons. We need to bring God into our atmospheres. We need to invite God into what we're doing. I get God is here. God is, you know, it, it says in the Bible, it says God is through me. He's above me and he's with me. Okay, I get that. God is never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. But I think it's time to invite him in to the most minuscule of things. That when you open the kitchen cabinet and you don't think there's enough food, multiply it, Lord. When you open your checkbook and you know you don't, you, there's too much month to match the money you have, God, I desire a miracle. I'm going to sow into this miracle. When, when things are going you know, have, have a measure of difficulty. I think we need to uh, get excited about what God's doing because God is always on the move. It tells us in Isaiah that the government of God is ever on the increase. So we need to charge it. We need to charge that atmosphere. I'm, I'm not talking about just emotional. 
I like I like emotional atmospheres. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I have a high appreciation for those. I love seeing people get excited about things. I love when a miracle breaks out and people just, you know, the popcorn thing I was talking about. I love that. But I also recognize that sometimes the charge that comes into the atmosphere is waiting upon him, worshiping him, praying with him, letting him talk to you. How do you think revelation and wisdom come? It doesn't always come because we're going to get this download from heaven. And I do believe in those. I believe in that a lot. But I also think sometimes we need to open up our Bible. And we need to, to you know, open it up and say, God, give me revelation. Give me wisdom. The next one is um, momentum is the fruit, if you will, of, of grace and favor. You have grace and you have favor. The biggest dilemma in the church or the biggest challenge in the church in the area of grace and favor is we don't know, we, we think we know who deserves it and who doesn't. We've gone from being people of God, the body of Christ, to judges and lawyers. Judges and lawyers. We think somehow if somebody murdered somebody, and please, I'm not saying murder's okay, or had an abortion, or voted Democrat, that they're not a Christian. Guys, you know, we've all done our share of goofy things. That's all I'm going to say about it. You know, we can see momentum when we begin to agree in the fruit, in the favor, because momentum is less about talents and less about efforts, but it's an evidence of God's great grace. I don't know why the body of Christ has to do what it has to do, but we're all one. When we take the cup, we're taking the cup with people across all the nations, blue, red, Democrat, Republican, communist, socialist. Well, how could somebody be a communist? Well, well, okay. That's a whole other conversation, isn't it? Isn't it? How could somebody be a socialist? It's easy to read the Bible if you have socialistic tendencies and see that there's a lot of socialism in it. And I'll probably get letters on that one. Uh, you know, the words for gift and grace are interchangeable in the Bible. Uh, you know, we have our metron. Paul says, I have this sphere of influence. Sometimes it's bigger, sometimes it's smaller. But in the midst of that, you know, I have grace and I have favor to do those things. I think momentum has a lifespan. I don't think you can always have your foot on the gas pedal. I don't want to say it's just a season because God lives outside of our seasons. And if we fully begin to recognize that we're seated in heavenly places, high above principality, powers, and rulers of air in Christ, then we sit outside of time as well. But time is a measure or a metric that we use here on earth. But um, I, I just think that when I say the time is now for some things, I think the time is now. And I used to surf, and I don't want to miss the next wave. But I also recognize that not all waves are good for me. And I also recognize that some days there just aren't waves. And sometimes there's waves that I can't deal with. You know, a friend of mine is teaching his kids to surf. And I love watching it because I think there's something about that. I think momentum in the church is, is uh, I think it, it's attracted to wisdom. Wisdom has an attraction. Uh, you know, we, we, we read about it in the book of Proverbs. Um, just as Lady Wisdom is attractive to momentum, it talks about, you know, Madam Folly. You know, it talks about the foolish, the ones that think they can get away with things. You know, uh, I'm not just being, I'm not trying to be legalistic, but I'm saying, if I do good things in my life, predominantly good things will happen in my life. If I do bad things in my life, I can still have good things happen in my life, but I think the predominance is going to be on the negative things. If I, you know, if I just sit there and, you know, drink all the time, you know, drink alcohol all the time or smoke cigarettes or take drugs, ultimately there's going to be prices to pay. And I think the flip side of it is if I embrace wisdom and revelation, God will give me strategies. The Bible says in the Old Testament that nothing comes that he doesn't release to his prophet. 
you know? So I think we need to be careful. What are we doing that's foolish? If we know sewing is important, whether it's time, talent, or treasure, and we're not doing it, then inherently that probably is foolish. Well, you're just saying that. No, I'm not just saying that. I'm exhorting you. You're better than that. Grace and mercy will follow you all of your days. Um, I think... I think we don't understand, you know, as I've studied revival over the years and, you know, great moves and awakenings in the church, people have prayed and prayed and prayed and they've devoted themselves to fasting and prayer and, you know, all these things. And then in a moment, God just seems to blow the doors off everybody because I think there's something to that. And I don't think there's a rhyme or a reason to that. I know a lot of people call things revival. I don't call them that, but I think that, you know, momentum has the ability to be mysterious. You know, I don't think I don't think we can always be predictors of it. I think that we can look out and see the wave coming and say, this would be a really good wave to ride. But I don't know where that wave ends. I don't know if it ends out in, a, in an outbreak in a community, you know, in a rural town like Smithton or a Canadian town like Toronto or down, in, you know, down on the panhandle of Florida in, in, in Lakeland or, you know, country like Argentina or whatever. If you're in my church fellowship, you saw that I put up a video of some things that happened in Cali, Colombia. You know, I, I, I mean, I think there's principles, prayer, fasting, gathering, doing the things we know to be truth, but I don't think there's any one way. And I think when people try to say that, I think they're missing some of the point. And, and so I think we need to be careful, you know? I, I think we need to be careful how we walk in that. I think that momentum itself, just like a wave in the natural, has, um, I don't know about you, but when things are going really well, it's easy to feel invincible. And I think that there's almost a seduction in it, you know? That, oh, look at me. No, look at God. And in my early days, I probably did more of this than more of that. And, and now I'm just grateful for everything that God pours out. I'm grateful for the big victories. I'm grateful for the little victories. There's not a night that I don't go to bed and I'm just grateful. I'm grateful for my wife. I'm grateful for my children. I'm grateful for my grandchildren. I'm grateful for abundant grace. I'm grateful for the health I have. I wake up in the morning and the first words out of my mouth, thank you, Lord, for giving me this day. First words out of my mouth. I sit there, you know, my wife might, she, you know, she might think I'm sleeping or I have the pillow, not the pillow, but the sheet over my head. It's my, my prayer tent. I'm kidding a little bit. Uh, I, I gather with God. You know, I'm grateful. I'm walking down. I, I went for my walk today and I'm walking down. It's still kind of dark and I'm grateful for the light to come and I'm grateful for the, 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 the you know, I'm grateful that I get to live in such a cool community and have a place to walk and that, you know, I'm just I'm a foot away from rur rurality. You know, I, I'm the guy who's had the black bear wander through my yard and the, and the bobcats show up and all those things. So I'm super grateful about those things. For you, it might be something else that you have to be grateful for. You know, my daughter, my daughter, Amy, and I'm just kidding with her a little bit. You know, if, if a bear walked through her yard, she'd be telling her husband, uh, we need to find another place to live. But where she lives now, she's got all these, you know, deer in her backyard and geese, and ducks, and all these things. And, and nature is, is soothing to me. So how do I not get caught up in that? I stay humble. Sometimes that takes more work than anything else. I continue to honor others. I was thinking this morning as I was walking that I'm really grateful for the men and women who still speak into my life, still speak into my life at 65 years old. You know, I, I, you know I, I'm grateful and I wanna remain teachable. I really believe in the principle that we live from faith to faith and glory to glory. I know it's frustrating to some of my friends but I'm always on the pursuit of God. I'm not looking for the next big greatest revelation. I'm looking for God to reveal himself to me because I want to live in that place. I used to want to be an expert. And the longer I did this thing with God, if you will, the more I realized how little I know. So I don't need to be the expert. You know, 
times and seasons change my way of thinking and I think they change ours as well. I mean others. I think that in the beginning I was really idealistic and I had opinions about how to do things right and do and, you know where everybody else was going wrong but arrogance wasn't a great aroma to bring before the Lord. And I forgot about the body of Christ sometimes. I forgot that we're all in this together. You know, I, I said something stupidly in my, in my youth. Um, this apostle from the Midwest that I used to know, he used to come to my church every now and then. Um, he wrote a book, it was called The Cult of Cannibals. And he'd gone through a really bad time in his life. And he wrote about it. And everybody said, see, I told you, you Christians, you just stink. There's always going to be a Judas in your life. Yeah, there is. But like Timothy, there's always going to be a Paul in your life. And like Paul, there's always going to be a Timothy in your life. And like Paul, there's always going to be a Barnabas in your life, if you allow it. And I think it's really, really important that we don't lose sight of that in the middle. You know, when, when things aren't happening, you know, the, the prophet of old cried out. Even when the crops fail and the barn has nothing in it shall still declare God's God. Momentum, I think you have to have an appreciation of reward. I read that, and an understanding of the responsibility that comes with it. Because through progress and momentum comes great responsibility. There's also, you know, if you will, great reward. There's increased favor. There's increased opportunity, uh, influence. There's fruits of momentum that show up. The things I do today will have fruit somewhere down the road. The people I meet with this week, I believe that these things will, will travel on. As I told a couple of people yesterday, we are the chosen generation. We are not generations. We collectively are the chosen generation. It's time for us to get that. Well, Lee, you know that some people are boomers and some people are millennials and, you know, whatever. What I do know is the Bible doesn't discern that. He says that we should have honor for all. And uh, the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. And good stewardship of momentum means using what we have to bless and increase our message in the world. The Message Bible says this, the world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. It is the responsibility of those who enjoy momentum and blessing to be generous with what God has for them. Maybe you've lost your momentum. Maybe you don't know how to kickstart it. Begin baby steps today. If you knew you were to do something and you didn't, repent, change your mind, and go do it. You know? And rem be reminded that there are rhythms of grace. And grace is always available to us, but there are ebbs and flows in it. It doesn't mean that grace has given out or petered out. It doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean we're going to have a valley of grace and we should employ legalism. Paul says, God forbid. He was even stronger than that about some other things. You know, who bewitched you? Who taught you that? This is us. There is miracle working power in this. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body. As often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. Many people believe that the miracle working power of Christ dwells within this cracker, bread, whatever you're eating. The miraculous, the reminder that we are not a cult of cannibals, but we are the body of Christ. And each one of us has a purpose and a place. And each one of us has been graced with a gift. And in like fashion, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood sign of a new covenant where everybody's in. My momentum got stopped. I'm the first one to admit it. I pulled the plug on some things. 
And in the process of pulling the plug on some things, I lost my momentum. I didn't lose my love. I didn't lose what others might have. But I lost my ability to move things ahead. So just like my health, I'm jump-starting it. I'm going out on a daily basis and I'm walking, getting my heart beat up. Because I want to be alive. And I want to be responsible with what I've been given, whether it's been leadership in this season over abundant grace and its fellowship, or the dad I need to be, or the husband I need to be, or the grandfather I need to be. I need to be those things. And I need to sow those principles into people's lives. And I just need to believe that God's word does not return void. That the prayers I've uttered up for my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. Wait, Lee, you don't have any great-grandchildren. God knows them. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that the momentum that's been slowed and stopped, I pray, Lord God, that people have lost, you know, even as Jesus said, are you burned out? Are you tired? Have you uh, got tired of the legalistic religion that you've embraced? Are you ready for some refreshing? Will you spend some time with me? Will you come away with me, Lord? Let us understand the unforced rhythm of grace. So, Father, I bless my friends, my family, those who are watching, and I ask you, Lord Jesus, just to bring blessing into their lives and let them recognize it. Let them see how good and how great you are in their lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you need to contact me and you're on Facebook Live, you can do it there. Uh, you can reach out through email, phone. All my contact information is there. I love you guys. I appreciate you. Have a wonderful week. And just know that God is on the move.